Dealing with Grief in Islam Part 1 War Famine Suffering Not a day goes by that the evening news does not report horrific stories of humanity in despair, and of worldwide misery. On a more personal level, many of us have been stricken with grief and depression in our day-to-day -day lives. A loved one passes away. A financial downturn. A cheating spouse. Why then does God allow bad things to happen to good people? This is a question that people of many religious faiths have struggled with for hundreds of years. It is one of the greatest stumbling blocks to faith and has led countless people to disbelieve in God altogether. Theists have tried to reconcile God and evil in a number of ways. Some pagans claim that God hates evil, but he is powerless to prevent it. This idea, however, is rejected in the Quran because it questions God's status as the Almighty, Al Aziz, the All Powerful, Al Jabbar, the All Strong, Al Qa'i, and the All Capable, Al Qadir. Others have claimed that perhaps God is capable of removing evil, but he does not know when or where evil will happen. This idea relegates God to a fireman who only comes to the scene of a fire after half the building has burned down. Yet, this too is an unacceptable claim, for God's names in the Quran include the All Knowing, Al Alim, the All Seeing, Al Baser, the All Hearing, Al Sami, and the constant owner and controller of everything, Al Malik. In fact, it would be considered blasphemous to question God's power, if God wanted to remove all evil on this earth, then nothing could prevent him from that. Polytheistic religions further another hypothesis, God is good, but there are other evil gods who frustrate his goodness and spread corruption on this earth. God is therefore locked in a struggle with these other deities. Perhaps Satan is a counter-god with whom God must constantly battle with. Yet this idea, of multiple gods, is categorically rejected in the Quran, which calls God as the One, Al-Wahid, the One and Only, Al-Ahad, the First, Al-Awal, and the Last, Al-Akir. The Quran stresses that there are no gods besides God, for example, the Quran says. O people, your Allah is the true Allah, the One, unique in His essence and attributes. There is no other true God, and He is the merciful and His mercy is vast. He is compassionate with His creation, surrounding them with many blessings. Quran 2 163. With over a thousand verses to this effect, it would be impossible to believe in multiple deities, rather, there is one and only one supreme God. The ancient Gnostics had such a troubling time reconciling the evil of this world with God that they concluded that God himself must be evil. People who further this claim argue that God cannot possibly be all powerful and all loving at the same time. If God is capable of removing evil and does not do it, he must therefore be evil. Yet, this idea is unconditionally rejected in the Quran, which declares that God is the most loving, al wadud the most kind, Al-Bar, and the most generous, Al-Karim. The Quran also refers to God as the most merciful, Al-Rahim, the most beneficent, Al-Rahman, the most forgiving, al Ghafair, the Lord of infinite grace, Tul Fadl al adhim and the ultimate source of peace and safety, Al-Salam. Therefore, the Quran affirms that God is both all-powerful and most loving, so how can these two qualities be reconciled, given the fact that the world is full of evil? The Islamic perspective is that God causes bad things to happen in order to achieve a greater good. God afflicts his servants with suffering in order to mold them into the type of people he wants them to be. Through suffering, humans can develop qualities that last forever, steadfastness and patience in the face of great adversity, as well as great humility and meekness. Most importantly, suffering causes people to turn towards God for help, it establishes and differentiates the true believers from the false ones. Suffering causes people to remember God. Human beings tend to forget God when they are prosperous and only remember Him when afflicted with suffering. The Quran gives the example of a ship. When the ship is smooth sailing, then the occupants do not remember God, but when the wind threatens to capsize the ship, suddenly the occupants of the ship begin praying sincerely to God. The Quran says. And when you are afflicted, O idolaters, by some calamity or misfortune at sea such that you fear destruction, those whom you worship besides Allah leave your thoughts. And you only remember Allah and seek his assistance. Then when he assists you and saves you from your fears, and you return to land, you turn away from his oneness and supplicating him alone, returning to your idols. And man rejects the blessings of Allah. So do you feel secure, O idolaters, when Allah has delivered you safely to land that he will not make it collapse with you? Or do you feel secure that he will not make stones rain down on you as he did with the people of Lot? Then you will not find any protector to protect you nor any helper to save you from being destroyed. Quran 17 67 This example can be applied to our day-to-day -day lives. A person may forget God when his financial situation is good, but if he were laid off from work, then suddenly he'd be invoking God for help. 
When Prophet Muhammad declared God's message, it was the poor and the slaves who made up the bulk of his followers. The rich and prosperous leaders of Mecca, on the other hand, continued to live a life removed from God. It is well known that rich people, such as actors, singers, and other celebrities, live the most ungodly of lives. Meanwhile, the meek and needy cling to God more. This means that suffering is not necessarily a bad thing, and prosperity is not necessarily a good thing. God says in the Quran, Fighting in Allah's path has been chosen for believers even though it is something that is naturally disliked, because it means risking one's life and wealth. However, you may dislike something when, it is good and beneficial. An example of this is striving in Allah's path, which means, in addition to the great reward, the defeat of the enemy and promotion of Allah's word. On the other hand, you may like something whilst it is bad and harmful to you, such as holding back from fighting, this will result in you being defeated and the enemies gaining authority over you. Allah knows full well what is good and what is not, whereas you do not. Therefore, follow his instruction which is better for you. Quran 2 216 This is all a part of human psychology, we forget God in good times, and we remember him during times of distress. So God afflicts us with trials and tribulations so that we may turn to him and seek his grace. How many countless people have turned to God and were guided to Islam after having been afflicted with suffering upon suffering? An example that comes to mind is of a well-meaning politician who intends to do good, but once he comes to power, the system corrupts him. Soon, he starts giving and taking bribes, he begins to live the ungodly life of a rich politician, wasteful and extravagant. Then suddenly, God causes him to be arrested, the man loses all of his wealth, his wife leaves him, and he rots away in jail. Finally, after having pondered over his gains and losses, the man turns to God. So bad things happen to this man in order that a greater good could occur. When he was prosperous, he was heading towards hell, but when God afflicted him with distress, the man changed his course. The temporary suffering of jail is indeed a small price to pay for the eternal bliss in paradise. In conclusion, we see that God causes bad things to happen to good people, in order that a greater good come to them in the long run. Another good that comes out of suffering is that the soul is purified through it. Prophet Muhammad declared, By the one in whose hand is my soul, i.e. God, no believer is stricken with fatigue, exhaustion, worry, or grief. But God will forgive him for some of his sins thereby, even a thorn which pricks him. Musnad Ahmad Some people describe a feeling of heartburn when they grieve. On a physical level, that may just be gastroesophageal reflux disease brought on by stress and anxiety, but on a symbolic level. It represents the spiritual heart burning away sins like a powerful furnace. When a believer is struck with suffering, then God expiates some of that person's sins as a mercy. As a consequence, that person will not be punished for those sins in the hereafter and thereby will be pushed towards paradise. Perhaps a skeptic may wonder why God does not merely forgive his servants without afflicting them with suffering on this earth or in the hereafter. The response to this is that God does in fact forgive any and all sins, so long as his servant comes to him penitent and seeking his grace and forgiveness. Such a man that comes to God seeking forgiveness, God will forgive him without any penalty punishment, nor any retribution whatsoever. God will wipe away his sins as if they never occurred. According to Prophet Muhammad, whoever turns to God asking for penitence will be forgiven even if they, his sins, are, numerous, like the flecks of foam upon the ocean. As numerous as all the grains of sand, as heavy as the mountains, and as many as the drops of rain and the leaves on all the trees. God forgives those who seek his forgiveness, and this is because he loves those believers who humble themselves before him, those who seek penitence from him. And those whose hearts cry because they disobeyed him. The Quran says. Allah loves those that frequently repent from their sins. Quran 2 222 But what of the one who sins and never seeks God's forgiveness? What about the one who continues to sin without any plans to stop? God does not let all sins go unpunished because this would lead people to become negligent and wicked. The enforcement of punishment on these sinners is for their own benefit, just as a father's enforcement of punishment on his son is for the child's own benefit. For example, a six-year-old boy sticks his fingers in an electric socket. His father, fearful that the boy may electrocute himself, punishes him for that. A parent threatens to punish his child only as a benefit for the child. Even though the recalcitrant child might be too immature to realize that the punishment stems from his father's love and concern. If the child puts his fingers into the electric socket, it will be he himself, not his father, who will be electrocuted. 
Likewise, if we sin, we do this to our own detriment, and the glory of God is unaffected. The worldly punishment therefore is a means, not the ends, the goal of the punishment is not to punish, but rather to serve as a strong deterrent. If a father is too lenient with his son and does not say anything when the child puts his fingers in the socket, then the boy will not realize the gravity of what he is doing. He will then keep sticking his finger in the socket until one day he will get electrocuted and die. Likewise, if God does not send affliction down upon his servants, they might not ever realize the error in their ungodly ways until they reach spiritual death. For example, the philandering husband may never realize that his indiscretions will one day lead to the breakdown of his family unit. The compulsive gambler might not realize that his addiction will lead to bankruptcy, and the alcoholic might not realize that his drinking will lead to a life of misery and emptiness. So God sends down upon these people punishments, in order not only to expiate them of their sins, but also to alert and awaken them to their detrimental ways. Imagine the child who knows that his parents won't do anything if he is caught doing drugs. This would be parental negligence, and it would lead to the child harming himself without any fear of repercussions. Therefore, a responsible parent will establish certain guidelines so that the child knows that if he takes drugs, then he will be grounded. This causes the child to stay away from drugs for fear of being punished. Similarly, the creation of hellfire, though it is a punishment, is also a mercy to mankind, through the threat of it, God creates much good. Hellfire is a punishment that God threatens upon his servants, so that they may fear God and thereby obey him, such people will then become spiritual, righteous, and rightly guided. This will not benefit God, but rather it will only benefit themselves. God has no need for them, but they have a need for God in their lives. But God gives his servants many chances and warnings before he condemns them to hellfire. An analogy of this is of a police officer, who catches a speeding motorist. The first time she, the motorist, is caught speeding, the police officer gives her a warning. The second time, the police officer fines her $50. The third time, he gives her a hefty fine of $300. The fourth time, she receives community service hours, and the next time her license will be suspended, etc. Again, the police officer does not stop the woman for his own good. Rather, it is for the motorist's own good, so that she does not get into a traffic accident and harm herself. This is like God's methodology, he afflicts people with minor punishments in this worldly life, so that they might realize the error in their ways. In other words, God allows bad things to happen to good people so as to punish them for their sins. This punishment serves as a warning in order that they may correct themselves in this lifetime and thereby avoid punishment in the hereafter. Surely a motorist would rather be fined $50 as opposed to being locked up in jail. Likewise, a believer would rather be punished in this lifetime as opposed to being thrown into hellfire in the next life. What this means is that when a believer is struck with some sort of calamity, he should take comfort in the fact that his sins are being forgiven by God. He should know that God will compensate him for every woe and grievance, and God is most just. Prophet Muhammad told us that God will compensate his servants for even the minor hurt that comes from a thorn which pricks the skin. A believer who is going through a difficult time should never be ungrateful to God, nor should he question God's justice, because God will compensate everyone in the next life. This is God's promise to humanity. A believer who is aggrieved by trials and tribulations should take heart in the fact that he is one of God's chosen ones. Whom God loves enough not to punish in hell but rather whom he wishes to purify in this life. Another reason why God sends down trials and afflictions to people is so that they may be tested. The Quran declares. Did the people think that by saying, I brought faith in Allah, they will be left without any test to clarify the reality of what they said, are they true believers? The matter is not as they thought. Quran 29 2. This concept can be clearly understood if we take the analogy of marriage. A man might love and be loyal to his wife during good times, but when things become difficult, he might abandon her. For example, if she is young and beautiful, he will adore her, but if she gets cancer and thereby loses her physical beauty, the same man might abandon her. This shows that in reality he did not really love her. Similarly, a man should love God and obey him in not only good times, but also trying times. Hypocrites might call to God's way when the weather is good, but as soon as the storm brews, they abandon their faith in God. For example, during the time of Prophet Muhammad, may the mercy and blessings of God be upon him, there were many hypocrites who converted to Islam when it was beneficial for them to do so. In doing so, they were able to secure powerful positions in the Islamic government. But as soon as the going got rough, they began showing disbelief, even after they had claimed to believe. When a powerful enemy threatened to destroy the fledgling Islamic city-state, the hypocrites abandoned their faith. 
The enemies of Islam persecuted the early Muslims, torturing them, boycotting them, and even killing them. This really differentiated the true believers from the false ones, the true believers would stay true to God, even in the time of great adversity. Therefore, God tests the people, to differentiate the true believers from the hypocrites. God says. Did the people think that by saying, I brought faith in Allah, they will be left without any test to clarify the reality of what they said, are they true believers? The matter is not as they thought. I tested those before them, so Allah will make clear and disclose to you the truth of those who were true in their faith and the lie of those who were dishonest therein. Quran 29.2-3 This idea is repeated in numerous verses in the Quran, such as Allah would not leave you, O believers, as you are, mixed with the hypocrites with no separation between you, without making it clear those who truly have faith. So he separates you through different obligations and trials, to make clear those who have faith and those who are hypocrites, and to separate the good from the bad. He would not give you knowledge of the gabe, unseen, so that you could distinguish between a believer and a hypocrite. But Allah chooses whomever he wills of his messengers and gives them some knowledge of the gabe, as he gave his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, knowledge of the state of the hypocrites. So have faith in Allah and his messenger. And if you truly have faith and are mindful of Allah, then follow his instructions and stay away from what he has prohibited, so that you gain a great reward from Allah. Quran 3 179 God's messenger promised his followers that by becoming Muslim, they would attain success. When the powerful enemy almost overwhelmed the Muslim defenders, the hypocrites began to question the promise of the messenger of God, they even began to question the all-powerful nature of God. The Quran says, and that was when the disbelievers came to you from the top of the valley and from the bottom, from the east and west. When the eyes turned away from everything besides seeing the enemy and the hearts reached the throats due to intense fear. And you were thinking different thoughts regarding Allah. At times you were thinking of help and at times you were thinking of losing hope from him. In that position in the battle of the trench, the believers were tested through the enemies. On that day, the hypocrites and those of weak faith, whose hearts contained doubt said, the promise of Allah and his messenger for victory and being established on this land is false and baseless. Quran 33 10-12 The calamity made the hypocrites expose their disbelief, whereas it only made the true believers even more absolute in their faith. The Quran says of them. When the believers saw the companies which had gathered to fight them, they said. This is the test, tribulation, and help Allah and his messenger promised us, and Allah and his messenger were true in this, for it has occurred. And seeing the companies did not increase them except in faith and submission to him, Quran 33 22.